this is problem number six. It's from the 2016 AP Calc BC exam. Uh, and it's a non-calculator question. And as problem number six typically has been for the last handful of years, you see a serious question here. And so the one that they present us with in 2016 is F has a Taylor series about X. It converges to F for all X within the interval of convergence. We know that the function evaluated at 1 is 1. The der first derivative evaluated at 1 is negative 1 half. And then for the nth derivative evaluated at 1, what we're going to be able to utilize to, to find that value is going to be this formula right here. So whatever order of derivative we would like, we put that value in place of n, and then the output would be that derivative evaluated at 1. Uh, and it's kind of covered up here, but this says for n is greater than or equal to 2. So we'll be able to use this to find the second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative evaluated at 1. What part A asks of us is to write the first four non-zero terms and also the general term for the Taylor series for f about 1. And so the way that we carry out a Taylor series expansion is by using this definition right here. Uh, and this series is going to be based at 1, right? So that's why I have, you know, 1 in place of the value that you normally see here. Typically it's specified as c. Uh, and then that same value is also here. So our series is based at 1, which is the reason for the ones in those positions. And so if you go ahead and just apply this definition uh, to the index values of 0, 1, 2, and 3, uh, what you end up with, you end up with these four terms. And as long as none of these terms are 0, when we get the specifics for this particular function into these numerators, uh, we've got the first four non-zero terms. And so if you think about trying to simplify this, the function value at 1 is 1 divided by 0 factorial, which is 1, times something to the 0 power is 1. Our first non-zero term is 1. Uh, our next term, the index value of 1, is going to generate, well, f prime of 1 is negative 1 half. So you see my negative 1 half divided by 1 factorial, x minus 1 to the first sits there. So there's our second non-zero term. And then I've just continued to carry that out for the second derivative evaluated at 1. Now I did have to utilize this formula right here to generate that. So I just put 2 in place of these n's, gave me a positive 1 as the coefficient, gave me a, a 1 factorial within that numerator when I put 2 in for n, and then a 2 squared in the denominator. And then when you try to do the same thing for the third derivative evaluated at 1, uh, you end up with negative 1 fourth. So I have the positive 1 fourth divided by 2 factorial times x minus 1 to the second for my third non-zero term. And then my index value of 3 term is going to be negative 1 fourth divided by 3 factorial, which is 6, times x minus 1 to the third. What's our general term going to be? Well, our general term is going to be the nth derivative evaluated at 1. So we've got a formula for that right here. Right Here's our general term, nth derivative evaluated at 1, divided by n factorial times x minus 1 to the n. You know, on the AP exam, this line right here would definitely receive full credit. Uh, we will benefit in a step in the next piece or two uh, by cleaning this up a little bit. And so I went ahead and I, I tried to simplify a little bit. And so uh, here's a, a slightly nicer looking form of this Taylor series. First four non-zero terms and general term. Part B tells us that this series for F has a radius of convergence of two. We're then asked to find the interval of convergence and show the work that we use to build our result. And so normally when we're asked to find an interval of convergence, what we use is we use the ratio test. Uh, we can actually take quite a bit of a shortcut here because we know our series is based at 1, and they've already told us what the interval of, excuse me, what the radius of convergence is. Uh, if the radius of convergence is 2 and our series is based at 1, what you hopefully have come to recognize about intervals of convergence is that they're symmetric about where the series is based. This series is based at 1 meaning our interval of convergence has to go down 2 from 1 to negative 1 and up 2 from 1 to positive 3. The only thing that we have to consider is whether or not we can include either or both endpoints. Uh, so the ratio test, had we used that to arrive at this conclusion, we would have to recognize, hey, ratio test is inconclusive whenever that limit turns out to equal 1, it's going to equal 1 when we put these endpoints in, so what's going on with the series there? So I went back and I, I stole that simplified general term from the series in part A, and I put negative 1 in place of the x in the series, and if you put negative 1 
in place of this x right here, negative 1 minus 1 gives you negative 2 to the n in that spot. So what you're going to see on the, the screen for part b here is you're going to see this general term with negative 1 in place of x initially. And then on the second line, I, I've tossed 3 in place of x. And so when I put the 1 in place, excuse me, the negative 1 in place of the x, just said we got a negative 2 for this quantity right here. Now if we're trying to figure out what's going on with this series, when x is negative 1, it's going to make sense to try to clean this up. And it'd be really nice if I could cancel this 2 to the n with that 2 to the n. But because this is negative 2 to the n, I've got to do an intermediate step and before that cancellation can take place. So just think of this as negative 1 times 2. And then you can raise negative 1 to the n and 2 to the n. And that lets you cancel these. And then if you multiply these together, uh, that's really multiplication of like bases, negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the n. And when you multiply like bases, you can add the exponents. And n plus n is, of course, 2n. Uh, negative 1 to the 2n. No, no longer an alternating series here because 2n is always even, meaning this numerator is always positive 1. Well, positive 1 over n is the harmonic series, which diverges. Therefore, we're not including negative 1. Well, what about 3? Well, we toss 3 in. Uh, we get 2 inside this quantity that's raised to the n power right away, our cancellation happens right away. We do have an alternating series here, and it's actually the alternating harmonic series, and what we know about that is that it converges, and that's why we can include 3. Part C wants us to use our Taylor series from part A and try to estimate f of 1.2 with it. It says use the first three non-zero terms of that series from part A to approximate f of 1.2. So it's basically the, the second degree Taylor polynomial for f based at 1 to approximate f of 1.2. And so this is just a screenshot of our, our conclusion from part A. And so if I'm going to use the first three non-zero terms, this term, this term, and this term, to estimate f of 1.2, I'm going to be able to claim that f of 1.2 is approximated by this minus this plus this with 1.2 in place of the x's. So that's what you see right here. Uh, as I've said once before in this video, this would receive full credit on the AP exam. Uh, if you're in a college classroom, you'd probably be required to do a little bit more simplification. So if you take the time to simplify that a little bit, uh, it should work out to 181 over 200 for the estimate for f of 1.2. And then in part D, it says show that this approximation from part C is within 0 0.001 or 1 1 thousandth of the exact value of f of 1.2. Now here you've, you've kind of got a couple different options. Uh, when you use a Taylor polynomial to make an estimate like we just did in part C, you can try to establish your error with the Lagrange error bound, which is kind of tricky to deal with. And in this case, what we can try to do as an alternative is we can try to use the alternating series error bound. Uh, so an alternating series that converges, as this alternating series does, when you estimate its sum with the first three terms, like we just did in part C, the maximum error is, is not going to go above the value of the first omitted term. And so the first omitted term from our estimate in part C would have been this evaluated at 1.2. And so that you can see right here. And, and when we establish an error bound, we care about the absolute value of the error. So the, the sign I have not carried down into uh, this calculation here. But if you simplify this, uh, what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with 1 over 24, the coefficient right here, and then 1.2 minus 1 to the third turns out to be 1 over 125. I didn't bother doing the math to multiply this out. What I realized was, well, if I did 10 times 100, I would be equal to 1,000 with my denominator. So if I do 24 times 125, I'm significantly larger with that denominator. So 1 over a denominator that's well above 1,000 is definitely going to be a smaller numerical value than 1 over 1,000. And so what we've just done is we've used the alternating series error bound to establish that uh, conclusion.